something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. didn't go looking for them. They found me, as I put it. And um, I just, I just want to know what's out there. There are many names on, on the reservation, but the one that, that really sticks out is Kualima. Kualima means big, big person, if I remember right. Really not much to it. Uh, back when I was a kid, I was always told stories of it uh, just to keep me from running away from the camping area, keeping, keeping me around the area at night. We were always told as kids that if we wandered away from it, that they would come and take us, just pick us up and take us into the woods. A guy told me one time, that's a man's world out there, and it is. It's a dangerous place, very dangerous. I've come across backpacks and shoes in the bush shredded and made me wonder if somebody met their end there. So you just don't play around. It's, you just don't play around with nature and the type of animals you got out there. To me, it's like exploration going on to another planet. One of the things that amazes me when we're out in the bush is that you can look forever, you can travel all day long, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, going in the most remote places you can imagine, perfect times, feeding grounds even, where you know there's plenty of berries and food, salmon and we don't even see a bear, a black bear. And there's hundreds of black bears in this general area. We don't even see a deer. It's just unbelievable. At night, you can set up on Lake Harrison here where we're at now. You can go 20 miles up there and look up towards Mount Breckenridge and you won't see a flashlight, a car light, nothing. There are places, it's so thick and remote. You could hide a dinosaur up there and no one would never know it. Well, mine goes back to 1980 to a fishing trip I went on in northern Minnesota with a friend of mine. We got hung up in a feeder stream late one night and about 12:30, 1 o'clock in the morning, I think it was. The fishing had died down real still and quiet and I started hearing a, a pounding sound. Um, the best way I could ever describe it to people is it's like tapping your chest with your fist and getting that dead thumping sound. But it was getting louder gradual, real slow and gradually louder. And then I started hearing a breathing sound going in and out, <sighs> like this. And it kept a perfect rhythm. The pounding kept a perfect rhythm. And I'm thinking, this must be the world's largest bear or something big is headed our way. I hope it doesn't come out of the night and we're sitting here in a few feet of water in a bass boat with only fishing poles to defend ourselves. Well, this thing just kept coming like it was coming right towards us. Now I'm 20, 22 years old, not afraid of anything in them days. Wouldn't want to admit to anybody that I was, and I was scared to death. I started getting really nervous. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. This pounding's getting louder, just like this, and the breathing's getting louder. And all I can tell you is something large on two feet ran by us on the shoreline, never broke its stride, never stopped its breathing pace just like a machine. I don't think it ever knew we was there. And it just came right by from left to right for that brief moment. And you look at it like, what the hell was that? And then it just starts going away. And you start hearing everything in reverse that you heard coming towards you. It sounded like a jogger running. I should have known that. I was thinking four-legged animal, but it wasn't a galloping sound. It was just like two feet pounding the ground.
people come up to me sometimes and they'll say, you're absolutely start raving nuts. You're crazy because you, sat, you research Sasquatch. I will say to people, especially those who know me, say, do I exhibit any other peculiar behavior in my life? No. So why do you think I would suddenly start exhibiting crazy behavior when I look for this animal? And the same applies to anybody who's involved in the Sasquatch field who is a relatively sane human being. We've seen evidence, and this evidence requires further examination. If we were crazy, we'd believe that Sasquatch was dropped on this planet by UFOs and dematerializes, okay? That's crazy. What we believe is there's a biological entity on this planet that simply hasn't been put into a classification yet, and that's what we want to do. First time I saw a footprint, you know, sinking an inch in the ground while I was walking around on top of the ground, that, that, that was a shock. You know, this, there is something. I, mean, I, I got into the trouble of going to California, but I was not mentally prepared to see anything like that. So I wanted to know what was making those tracks. And that's basically the pursuit I've been following for nearly half a century. The two things that are facts and cannot be disputed, not knowledgeably disputed anyway, that something makes enormous footprints that indicate enormous weight. And there are thousands of people whose word would not be questioned on any other subject who tell of seeing a huge hair-covered biped in North America. And science cannot explain that fact and isn't trying to. There are precious few scientists, very few scientists, who are willing to say about this phenomenon that the, the evidence such as it is would suggest to us that this bears looking into in, in an experimental or an open-minded way. Very few. That's why I respect those few, such as John Binder Nagel, and a very few other people with a scientific background who are willing to do so. It's not a matter of belief or faith in something here. It's a matter of having scrutinized the evidence and found it adequate and realizing that others are unaware of a lot of this evidence, of most of this evidence. Our problem is to attract scientific colleagues to scrutinize that evidence. But scientists are, uh, in a sense, businessmen as well. They've got to appro appropriate, proportion their time to those things that are going to produce the most likely positive results. And uh, Sasquatch does not make the cut. There is no preventing model of anthropology and zoology, I would suggest, that eliminates the possibility, let alone the likelihood, of Bigfoot, not on an evolutionary ground, not on a biogeographical ground, not on an ecological ground, not on a metabolic ground. The only thing that keeps scientists, I think, from putting their necks out and saying, this is something worth our looking into, is their own fear of ridicule. It's not that scientists are out there looking for it and can't find it. Scientists are looking the other way. It's not the Sasquatch, which is eluded scientists, but scientists which have chosen to elude the Sasquatch. They don't want to hear about it. Scientists are not used to working in areas where there's hoaxing going on, where there's um, people fooling other people. That's very much contrary to the scientific method, which is very much open and accountable, and everything is published and is open to scrutiny. The area is riddled with hoaxery. Nobody denies that, and scientists try to stay away from that sort of thing. When we talk about the Sasquatch as just another North American mammal, you know, I always think of my work doing wildlife surveys, especially mammal surveys, where we are able to determine the presence of a mammal in an area on the basis of its tracks. Mammals aren't like birds. They're not so easily seen. They're elusive. They're often nocturnal. So we look for sign. We look for tracks. We look for scat. We look for feeding sign. On the basis of seeing bear tracks, we say, yes, there are black bears in this area or grizzly bears. And so this is, this is the this, this, same with the Sasquatch. This is an original. This is the best cast, actually, that my wife and I were able to make uh, here on Vancouver Island. Unfortunately, between the time we found them and the time we got back with plaster, a hiker had stepped in it, so there's a bit of a boot print there. But other than that, it, it's just an awfully good, awfully good cast, uh, showing the large heel and the five toes. Here are a couple of casts of an immature Sasquatch from uh, Washington State. And pe people often say, well, 
Gee, if you got a young Sasquatch, the track would look like a human track, wouldn't it? Well, they, they don't, actually. Uh, one of the things uh, quite common in Sasquatch tracks is the, the spreading of the toes. The Sasquatch foot seems to be, well, is much more flexible than the human foot, which is quite rigid by comparison. It's almost like the, like the human hand, and then the toes quite commonly spread out like that. This is the largest cast in my collection. It, it, it's noteworthy from that, for that point of view. It's also noteworthy because the big toe, the great toe, is quite divergent, sticking off to the side, which is very much an ape characteristic. Of course, in the great apes, the big toe is often straight out. In the Sasquatch, the big toe often diverges somewhat, and that's uh, quite unhuman-like. That's a gigantic cast. That's it, a it, it's animal. a very large track. There's a bit of slide in here. I'm sure that the, the hue actually started about there. But yes, yeah, this this is an interesting cast because it shows another characteristic of the Sasquatch foot, and it, it just as is shown in these young ones, and that is it is proportionately broader than the human foot. UFOs and Bigfoot are probably about tied for fraud. Bigfoot fraud is somebody strapping a big pair of wooden feet to his feet and stomping around in the bush and then taking clay molds of it or whatever. When you're up in the bush and you come across a set of tracks so far removed from any of the nearest roads, you didn't even know you were gonna be at that spot at that given moment. Who on earth put those tracks there? How did they get there and why are they there? You can't just turn away from that and just scoff and say, ah, somebody's playing a joke. If you're gonna play a joke, you're gonna go down by a park where you know people see something. You're not going to go way up in the bush. I, I've seen instances where I pushed a bush back to step down off of a log fall, and there was a track right there where the animal obviously had stepped where the bush was and, and m moved it out of the way as it passed through, and the bush covered it back over and protected the track. Now, nobody set that hoping I'd see that someday. That's ludicrous. <laughs> up to Harrison Hot Springs to uh, pay a visit with a colleague of mine named Bill Miller, who's an American from Illinois. Uh, the last two summers now, we've been using Bill's uh, Polaris Ranger, which is sort of a six-wheel all-terrain vehicle, which basically gets can go anywhere. The only thing I think would be better would be a horse. Well, Highway 7 here, also known as Lahey Highway, at one time was known as Scenic Sasquatch Drive because so many people reported the thing crossing in front of them at night right on this road. We've actually passed a couple of spots where sightings have occurred. Yeah, Sasquatch was a Coast Salish word, which uh, basically translated into wild man of the woods. And it was here in the 1920s that really the, the non-native community got found out about it. I've been fascinated by this mystery ever since I was old enough to read. I still remember my mother telling my father, don't worry, he'll grow out of it, but it never happened. I love the outdoors and I love a mystery and the two just went together hand in hand. They named this place Sasquatch Provincial Park for reasons, because of the long history of sightings and all that that's always happened here throughout. If we take a fake foot, like your, like your shoe, you walk through this snow with your shoes on, every print you make is gonna be a duplicate of the last because you're walking with a solid, inanimate object. But when you're talking about a real working foot, there are signs you can look for. Bucklets, boots. We know from the old days, Green, all these guys that documented these things, people's tracks are offset. When you watch, see your tracks in the snow or in the sand, left, right, they're just a little bit offset, usually pointed outward. A Sasquatch walks almost pigeon-toed, but he walks like he's walking a tightrope almost. Every track is almost the same in, the, in a straight line in front of the other one. Another thing we look for is, is it a fake track? When you see a line of tracks and you see toe movement between the tracks, you no longer have a, a fake foot or else somebody's able to carry a bunch of uh, fake feet with them and somehow put it on between strides without putting a foot down. That makes no sense at all. A tip is to not try to sneak around in the field. Uh, they are 
far superior to us as far as living in the forest and, and all of their senses are better than ours. And so I, I would strongly recommend that someone who wants to um, draw a Sasquatch to you, because that's what it's going to be. You're not going to go find a Sasquatch they're going to find you. So go into a likely area. Do not be quiet. Be loud, have fun, laugh, because that's what we do. We sing in the field. I mean, honestly, anything that you can do that's gentle, that's not aggressive. The lady who owns a store in Seashell, she'd driven the same route home for 10 years. Then one night she went home, just as it was getting dark, this thing crossed the highway, the major highway, and crossed right in front of her. And her little little daughter had seen it. She was with her on the road when it crossed in front of them. Yeah. And she calls it the big monkey. So it's not a matter of whether or not she saw nothing, she saw something, and the little girl, small as she is, knows what a monkey is. And in her mind, that's what she saw something that looked like a monkey. And the lady on top of everything else, even though she talked to Tom, she doesn't want her name out there. These aren't people looking for publicity. These are people that just want to tell what they saw because they think it's that important. I find I almost have to pry a Sasquatch report out of an eyewitness. I'll hear that someone has had a sighting. I'll approach them they'll wonder how I got their name, they won't want to talk, and there's al almost a bit of a dance going back and forth, and finally, I, I hear the report. I think I have a pretty good idea what Sasquatches look like, uh, the various anatomical features that recur consistently again and again. And, and of course, I, I'm looking for those in, in the eyewitness descriptions. I'm not leading the eyewitness to provide them, but I'm certainly w measuring them as, as these things come up. Eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable. Uh, as skeptics, we, we harp on that all the time. Uh, people's ability to confabulate their own memories, uh, to inject memories into their, uh, their own recollection. Any young child will know all an adult has to do is make a suggestion to you, you know, did you see that, son? And five years later, you'll swear, um, yeah, I saw it with my own eyes. Definitely, I can you know, give you details about it. When you Consider all the things that people could describe. There's just a marvelous consistency in what they do describe. As word started getting out of what I was doing, taking in reports and going out at night and looking for, I call them the, the night walkers, the elders of the tribe were uh, telling me that it was uh, bad medicine to uh, continue what I was doing because I was dealing with something that was more powerful than anything that I could imagine. And I, I thought strength-wise, but uh, they told me spiritually that uh, they, can, uh, they can take you. It was standing next to a tree. My partner had seen it first from a glimpse and we drove right by it. He said there was something standing back there. So I backed the truck up, and I was looking to my left. And then as I was looking to my left, he goes, there it goes. And then I turned immediately to my right, and I saw something go from completely standing to a full out run, turning into almost a blur, really, as fast as it was moving through the trees. It was gone, it was, and within two seconds, I immediately grabbed my stuff. I, when I work in the woods now, I always carry a camera with me. I grabbed my, uh, my, my field vest, and I, I took off after it. And I found the impressions in the ground, and I started tracking it. And uh, we tracked it over the hillside, and that's when we lost it. Sasquatch mystery. It sort of tells you that there's still wilderness out there. There's still places we haven't trodden yet. There's still things to discover. There's still things to see. You know, there's still mysteries to solve. And to me, the Sasquatch is exactly that. It's wilderness. You know, it's the unknown. It's 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 the last frontier, and we're trying to find it.
people would rather mythologize than just accept that certain things aren't known, that maybe one day science will explain it, maybe not. Bigfoot and monsters in general have a very persuasive power about them. They often hail from remote regions, uh, the forest, uh, mountain tops, that sort of thing. I think that kind of, there's an allure to, to remoteness, probably something to do with our evolutionary heritage. Um, remote areas were scary for good reason, and people have, their brains are biologically hardwired to fear the unknown because the unknown could have, you know, a tiger there or something that we should avoid. The one that I saw briefly was about seven to seven and a half feet tall. It was dark in color. Uh, hair must have been about maybe three inches in length. Uh, it wasn't particularly heavy uh, in, in body mass. It was, it was, pre it was really lean. Uh, legs were long. From eyewitness descriptions of the Sasquatch, it's, it's very, very ape-like. Most of the anatomical features are ape-like. What is human-like is that bipedal gait, walking on two feet like humans, the foot shape with the big toe lined up alongside the others, very human-like uh, looking foot. As we get into the great ape literature deeply, we find that, no, that, that's not actually all that human-like. In the gorilla foot, the big toe can also line up with the other toes, and gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans do walk on two feet from time to time. So I think we'll find out that it's an ape. I honestly believe that this creature has to be part of the Homo branch. It has way more human features than it does ape-like features. It's not a hybrid of both. I certainly can't see that. I see its humanity. I see its reticence. I see its shyness. I see its behaviors, its curiosity. This is, this is a creature that is far more intelligent than people give it credit for. Um, it has also managed to elude us for so long. Uh, the same cannot be said of gorillas and chimpanzees and the other higher rapes. Certainly humans, chimps, gorillas, orangs, and Bigfoot, if it walks, would belong to the very same family. And you can call that family great apes. So does that make Bigfoot a man or an ape? Well, men are apes. Men and women are apes. We don't like to be reminded just how similar the great apes are to us. We like the idea of a nice wide gap there between humans and other, other mammals of all sorts. Charles Darwin said people are far too, he didn't use the language hung up, but he essentially said people are far too concerned with the question of, of, the, of the difference between humans and other apes. Perhaps that difference isn't even very consequential. And I think that's one of the problems with the Sasquatch. It's disturbing and upsetting because it does look so human-like. I'm in total agreement with John Green. I believe this is a bipedal ape thought to be extinct, the Gigantopithecus. If a species of Gigantopithecus still walks, that wouldn't make it any different from a lot of other species that still exist, like the mountain lion that's been around for a very, very long period of time. It's, it would simply mean it was pretty darned adaptable and pretty well suited to its, to its habitat. Canada's a huge country. I don't know how many millions of square miles of unexplored, rugged terrain there is out there. And that's one of the bits of evidence you might say uh, for Sasquatch. I would argue that absence of evidence is evidence of absence for the most part in this case. Uh, human beings have occupied this part of the country for a very long time. And it's difficult to imagine that a breeding population of creatures as large as Sasquatch, the Sasquatch is reputed to be could have avoided uh, detection for so long. Well, yes, that is the absolute keystone question in this entire discussion, because it's, we can talk about all the evidence in the world that, that bears consideration that we shouldn't discount and so on, and we always come down to that exact question. And it is a big question. It's a really tough one to get over, and it's the one that keeps me still, uh, I think, appropriately skeptical at this point, even though that skepticism is weaker than it used to be. At any given time, only a small proportion of that countryside has human eyes focused on it. So there's a huge amount of tangled, wild country in which something could remain hidden. But then you have to add to that an animal of extreme physical adeptness. Now, this is an athletic animal. We know this from all the reports. 
and by the way, of course, a, a substantial intelligence. Add in the quality of an animal that is self-aware. Now, I mean, I'm not the first person to mention that Bigfoot is self-aware, but if you add that in with those other qualities, and that it's aware of the plight that might result from hanging out with the other two-footeds because of guns, because of trucks, and so on and so forth, and there are encounters, then you can begin to imagine an animal that actually could remain hidden under these circumstances. carry a camera with you at all times. Because if you're in a position to ever see one of these things, it's gonna happen very quickly. And if you don't get a photograph of it, you're simply another person who says he saw a Sasquatch and we have thousands of those. Well, the way I go about researching, at the beginning, I would take newspaper reports and, and people telling me that something's happening in this area, something's happening in that area, and I would, uh, run over there real quick and, and ambulance chase. And uh, quickly I, I saw that my resources were dwindling because nobody's paying for this except for me. And I uh, determined that, you know, I'm going to stick closer to home. I'm going to concentrate in one area. So I've got a study area that I've been working on for about 20 years. I use everything from satellite imagery down to digital sound blasting and uh, digital imagery. I've got Starlight scopes, infrared, uh, got pheromones. In the case of Bigfoot, we don't really see that we're getting any better, higher quality data since the 1958 uh, first documented footprints were discovered. The quality of the data, the, the sorts of data that we're getting hasn't really improved. You know, our technology is improving and we're not seeing that translating into better data, which is suspicious. The higher the technology, the less the result I'm getting. Even if I saw a Bigfoot in a starlight scope, nobody believed it was a Bigfoot. I think any scientist looking at it is just going to go, well, that's interesting, but I'm not interested. <laughs> because scientists have chosen not to study the Sasquatch, dedicated amateurs have come along and, and kind of filled that vacuum and taken it on. And most of them are doing a very good job. They're not always as well trained or as disciplined as they could be. On the other hand, it's not their job. I think if my biologist colleagues ever actually decided to get involved here, we'd move ahead really quickly. We were investigating a story. We went out to this clear cut and we let out these huge screams just on top of our lungs, just loud screams to attract attention to something. And so we walked into the trees and uh, as we were going into the timber, uh, we found a game trail we started following this game trail. And uh, we took about four or five more steps down this game trail and then we heard this <sighs> And uh, my partner was in the lead and he put his right hand up and I stopped and he pointed off to his left telling me the direction that he'd heard it and then I pointed in the same direction. Now deer are, you know, and bears and any other animal can make that sound, that, that, that little huffing noise. If you're hunting them, and if a deer spots you, they'll do the same thing. They'll huff at you and then they'll stamp their hoof down on the ground. So that's what we thought we had. And then it did it a couple more times. And so my partner turned the same direction and did the same, same sound, just that <laughs> And it immediately answered them. And it was like, it's unusual. It's, there's, you know, I don't know why an, another animal would do that. And they exchanged a couple more of them sounds, and then it whistled. Whatever it was whistled at them. And I was, that's when my heart just started beating out of my chest. Because there was no way that a deer or anything else could have whistled that, that particular tone that came out of it. He looked at me and I looked at him and we was just big eyed and it was like, you know, what we had going on there. And then it went back to the huffing noise 
evolutionarily, as we've seen, there is no problem evolutionarily if this animal is Gigantopithecus. That's an animal that we know walked. Chimps and gorillas do not appear in the fossil record, but giant apes do appear in the fossil record. The Sasquatch is sort of like the modern gorilla. People have heard about it. They've heard myths and legends. For that's all a gorilla was from Roman times until the, the 19th century. It was a legend. It was a story. And then you can hear something walking away. And so I close my eyes. And you can hear it just slowly moving away from us. And... After it left, my partner came walking up to me and started talking about what had just happened. And uh, so we just heard a snap. Biogeographically, there's no problem for Bigfoot being in North America because there have been at least two other major colonizations of North and South America by primates, the New World monkeys and Homo sapiens probably through several different uh, colonizations across the Bering Land bridges and perhaps otherwise as well. So we just heard a snap and then it came back and then it started huffing again. Heard this <sighs> and he started exchanging the huffing sounds with it and then it did the exact same whistle. Something ran away. We could hear something running away and my partner put his arm up and he started following it like that. And then whatever was over here did it again. And I told him, no, it's still there. Ecologically, that's a question people ask. Is there anything for it to eat out there, this great big animal? Well, posit an animal that averages eight feet tall and weighs 800 or 1,000 pounds. What's it going to need calorifically? Well, let's say probably 5,000 calories a day would be a maintenance diet for it. So it would need the equivalent amount of food of, you know, four or five people probably to get by. You're not talking about a lot of animals that have to be sustained. There are n number of tons of mountain ash berries throughout the Dark Divide and throughout the Cascades in the autumn huckleberries and whortleberries and blueberries, but they're not eaten off the vine, off the tree. There's a lot of food that goes uneaten out there by a large animal. I do imagine a, an omnivore here, like many other primates. It eats meat when it's able. You could still hear whatever it was running away, and then this thing drew our attention back to it, and then it stopped, it got quiet, and then that's when we raised our hands up and slowly backed out of the area. And it's experiences like that that have me respecting him more, that, that this thing is a living being. And yeah, it's out there, but I'm not gonna show that I'm aggressive to it and that I'm, I'm gonna cause harm to it. Roger Patterson wrote one time, to the adventurer doesn't stop at the foothills but penetrates deep into the forest. To me, if you're going to look into anything, you should look into it thoroughly and not just half do it. It's like an adventure. It's a mystery. It's something that's come to me that I've had a taste of. And because of that, I can't let it go. Back in 1967, a series of events took place in the Bluff Creek area and the Blue Creek Mountains area of California. John Green and Rennie DeHinden flew down to look at a huge number of footprints that had been found on a road construction site. At this time, John Green got in touch with an average Sasquatch researcher and author by the name of Roger Patterson, who was a, a jack of all trades and living in Yakima, Washington. Roger and Bob Gimlin started to organize a little expedition of their own, and the two of them set out in a bid to film more footprints. This was ostensibly the reason they went down. And Roger rented a 16 millimeter camera. On the morning of October 20th, 1967, Bob and Roger had a discussion about what they were gonna do that day, and they mutually decided that they were gonna return up the Bluff Creek 
to look up there again just in case anything had come back into the region. And about 1.15 in the afternoon, uh, they came around a bend and uh, for whatever reason, they were able to smell something that Bob Gimlin described to me as smelling like a very stinky, wet dog. And when they looked over to their immediate left, they realized that they, they were looking at a female Sasquatch. Patterson at this time slid off the back of his horse and possibly in that moment damaged a stirrup and injured his foot, but still had the presence and foresight to whip the 16 millimeter camera out while Bob Gimlin pulled out a 306 rifle and held it on his lap, covering Roger as he ran towards his creature, which was now making a beeline away from them. And at a point, frame 352 in the film, the creature actually turned around and looked at them. A sort of a glare like you follow me and you, there are consequences and it continued to walk away from them. Bob tried to continue tracking that animal for, for quite a distance but it had gone up a hill and it wasn't conducive to ride a horse up that hill in pursuit of this particular animal. Ever since then um, that film has been the subject of controversy. Well for one thing uh, a group of skeptics uh, did look into it and they, they p took a, 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 the same type of camera with the same lenses and the same type of film and went out to the same sort of terrain and attempted to recreate uh, the shot. They didn't bother putting the, uh, the person involved into a, a big hairy ape suit. And no one has ever done that. No one. The skeptics, they'll come out and say, ah, it must be this, must be that, oh, it's a hoax. Fine. I, okay, I'll accept your, your position, but just don't say it. Tell me why it's a hoax. Don't tell me it walks like a man just because it's on two feet. The film was subsequently taken a few years later by René de Hinden to the Soviet Union. And while he was there, he visited a number of Russian scientists who were absolutely beguiled by what they were seeing, the most prominent being Dmitry Donskoy. Donskoy is the man who was responsible for preparing the Russian athletes for the 1972 Olympic Games. And he was a biomechanicist. He knew everything about stride lengths. He knew about how the muscles work and how people walk and locomote. The minute he saw the photograph of this creature, just a photograph, he said to De Hinden, he says, I know how that thing walks. And he replicated awkwardly, like a human would, this unnatural gait of this creature. And then when he ran the film, he pointed out to De Hinden right away, this thing doesn't walk like a human being. When a human being walks, our knees lock. This thing walks with its knees bent which indicates a huge stride when it walks. How do you walk and lift your feet perfectly vertical to the ground, the toe straight down, the heel straight up, and do it and keep that center of gravity moving where you do it so smoothly, it's like a natural walk for you. This is considered by many to be uh, some of the best evidence for Sasquatch there ever was. Uh, in terms of what I have here, it's a full size frame from the Patterson film, approximately life size, give or take an inch or two. And as you can see, this is a very, very big creature. I'm six feet five, weigh about 225 pounds. You can see her body density is much larger than mine. You'll also notice that the mouth is far lower on her face than it is on mine, for instance. You will also notice that this creature has breasts. Now that would have been a tremendous creative streak in terms of uh, Roger Patterson constructing a gorilla suit, as it were, with breasts built in. It's not impossible to do, but why would you do that when the story of Bigfoot pretty much was built on a foundation of a male Sasquatch rather than a female? We can also see down here on the thigh that there appears to be a hernia. Athletes get herniated muscles, and the hernia, when the muscle reaches a certain extension, causes it to bulge. The hernia moves in perfect uh, harmony with the contraction of the femur muscle as the creature is walking in the film. And they believe that's what that is, something you wouldn't be able to attribute to a suit. Janusz Brochaska, who was well known back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s for his ape costumes, said, and I quote, if this is a man in a costume, then every single hair was glued to his body, otherwise you would never have seen those muscles. I've read all the accounts of its dismissal and so on and so forth. I'm not convinced by any of them. Uh, I still feel that the evidence, uh, that what we call evidence, the canon of evidence, should include the patterson gimlin film. People say, that's proven to have been a hoax, right? 
Well, no, it hasn't been proven, but that's the perception out there. So I don't, I don't raise that film anymore, and it's very sad, but raising it as evidence just gets you into a discussion about he says, she says, and claims and counterclaims. I think we should just put that film aside for now, get on with the really hard evidence, especially the tracks, and then one day that we can bring that film back and say, well, what we now know about the Sasquatch is there in that film. In the 19th century, we were finding a lot of new species, we were cataloging them, but in the 20th century, we haven't found a lot of new species. The pygmy chimpanzee was discovered in the 1920s, but since then, there really hasn't been much big mammals or big animals discovered. Um, and uh, to postulate that there's this great ape that's seven or eight feet tall that we still haven't classified scientifically to many minds, it just doesn't fit with that pattern of discovery. My biologist colleague just loved to discover the presence of a new animal, a new small mammal or a new bird in an area. I mean, it, it, we sort of thrive on that. Now here we have something, but this is too big a discovery. I actually had a, a professional colleague at a university say this to me one time. He said, but John, if this thing existed, it would be the zoological discovery of the century. And he kind of left it hanging as if to say, and of course that can't be, can it? Science, uh, scientists, they pick a project and they get expert at that project. Say a physical anthropologist specializes in Gigantopithecus. He's not going to uh, branch off and say, oh, there's something a little bit more interesting over here and take that on. A scientist is a specialist. They're unanimous when they say what they need is a body or piece of the body, nothing else will do. So that means an animal has to be brought in. Now if that means that one has to be shot, then, then, then that then means that that's exactly what has to happen because we need the hard physical evidence to prove that the animal is real. Roger Patterson stated that he regretted that they not shot the animal and he never wanted to do that. Uh, I believe that's a rare animal but he took a lot of ridicule him and Bob Gimlin and uh, it frustrates me but I understand that scientists do need concrete evidence. I don't think you even necessarily have to kill the animal. I think if you can just get DNA of some sort, whether it be hair or whatever, then you've got to step in the right direction. At least they have to acknowledge there's an unknown primate running around. My experience from talking to hunters is that those hunters who have had a Sasquatch in their crosshairs, in the gun sights, have not been able to pull the trigger. They've seen an animal. First of all, it's not what they're hunting. It's, it's not a moose, it's not a deer, it's not a bear. Second, it is very human-like. Apes are very human-like, and they're not about to kill one. What we're all saying, I think we're all agreeing on, is that Bigfoot's not just another animal. This animal hasn't been in a zoo. It hasn't been shot and killed and brought before science. It's not sitting in a museum. It's the ultimate wild animal for my area. I'm not harming anybody. I've made sure that I, I don't harm anything. And I've thought about it, you know. Do I, you know, if I do find a Bigfoot, what am I, what am I gonna do with it? Do I want one sitting in a zoo? I sit there at the zoo and study these gorillas all the time. I mean, at least two or three times a month, I go to the zoo and watch them. And they look sad. They don't look like they want to be there. And if, if I saw a, a Bigfoot and it helped get one of those creatures inside of a zoo, I would be, I don't know. That is not what I want. There's a story um, <clears throat> that the Yakimas have that uh, they're part of us. Um, that uh, there were three groups of people here on the reservation. There were the big people, and that uh, there were the Yakimas, and then there were the little people. And during the European migration in this direction, the Yakimas kind of got curious of uh, the new tools and new trinkets coming across. And they moved down into the valleys while uh, the big people want nothing to do with it. The Yakimas tried to go back up into the high country and uh, rejoin them, but uh, were told that uh, if they wanted to continue with uh, what they were seeing, then they were not allowed to come back. 
Bigfoot I've often heard described as sort of um, a symbol of green spirituality, a symbol of our lost connection with the wilderness and um, with the sort of environment in which we used to live, a sort of oneness with nature that we're losing. So they're just uh, still living like uh, they were before what we have here. <laughs> It terrifies me to see sometimes just how far back into Sasquatch's habitat logging is going and development is going. And if we keep encroaching more and more on the wilderness habitats of this creature and various other ones, we're going to find that they're going to be extinct a lot faster than they would be if we knew our, our boundaries and didn't exaggerate them. There's something admirable in Bigfoot if Bigfoot walks. Bigfoot is an animal that will have survived extraordinary pressures toward its own extinction for a very, very long period of time with, with great uh, fidelity to its ecosystem and, and presumably to one another. And with, a, with what we could imagine or call an extraordinary humility, this would be an upright ape which wasn't trying to dominate the world, trying to dominate every other species, uh, unlike a different species of upright ape I could mention. They don't need us. They've lived so many years, centuries without us. They're taught from a very small age how to act. Keep with the old way, keep with what you're doing. You don't need anything else. We've lived this long and uh, we'll continue. I respect them. They allow me to return to mine every day. And that's how I look at it now. So. I have the confidence that we'll look back and say, my goodness, now we see the discovery was unfolding. Maybe not quite as it should, but, you know, a certain amount of this resistance was just normal, natural, scientific resistance. If the world becomes so tamed that we can no longer even imagine giant hairy apes out in the forest, that we can't, if our hearts become so jaded, that we can't even imagine mysteries out there, then we've lost something absolutely profound. And if we're to proceed as if Bigfoot walked, whether or not it does, and treat its habitat, treat the ecosystem, as if it needs to be there to receive and sustain this animal, we will have gained something great and grand, regardless of whether Bigfoot was ever more than a shadow. I think it's highly likely that it's a great deal more than a shadow.